delicate city. It's been called the Switzerland of America. Settled in a cozy, out-of-the-way nook among the rocky hills that surround the banks of the Patapsco River, Ellicott City is a living and working town with an abundant history. From the very beginning, hardworking people have been attracted to the working environment of the city. In 1772, Joseph, Andrew, and John Ellicott came south from Bucks County, Pennsylvania to take advantage of the availability of water power and the fertile land of Maryland. In 18 short months, the brothers built a village from the ground up. Charles Carroll was a descendant of the Carroll family that settled in the area in 1688. A signer of the Declaration of Independence, he had political ties, not only throughout the region, but throughout the country as well. Business and personal interests drew him to the Ellicott family. The road the brothers built to connect Ellicott's mills to Baltimore was financed by Charles Carroll. It enabled the Ellicotts to market their goods in the city and export them overseas. When the road became part of the National Turnpike to Frederick and Points West, many businesses sprung up alongside of it. The village came to be known as Ellicott's Mills, and it expanded and grew rapidly over the years to include iron and copper works, a cotton mill, a general store, a school, and a Quaker meeting house. Ellicott's Mills became nationally known in 1830 as the site of the first terminal of the B&O Railroad. Thirteen miles of track were laid from Baltimore to a station house in Ellicott's Mills. That same year, the legendary Tom Thumb race took place, with a horse-drawn cart racing against a steam engine. The horse reportedly won that race, but the steam engine went on to become very popular and very useful to the residents of the town. It aided in the export of grains from Ellicott's Mills and in the import of items from around the world. As a result of the railroad and the National Pike, Ellicott's Mills became an important business community and a thriving town. The city was in its heyday in the mid-1800s. The shops and mills flourished. Business was good and the town had a lot to offer the customers that arrived on its doorsteps. The town in general was not a, a great fashionable center. Uh, it, it's no good picturing people in fancy dress going up and down the street. There were working people. There was a, there was a, a blacksmith shop. There was a wheelwright. There were uh, uh, livery stables and uh, uh, stores that sold uh, various things. Thriving commerce and uh, and hard work. And although the the Ellicotts, of course, had been very substantial people when they came, they were Quakers. And there was not much ostentation. Things were kept pretty simple. Times were good until the early 1900s. When Route 40 opened in 1938, it became the main road for travelers. And downtown Ellicott City began to decline. Public transportation, like the trolley and bus services to Baltimore, was removed, and the town was left behind during a national spurt of growth. The biggest change that probably came into Ellicott's Mills was within this century, after World War II. Uh, and um, there was just, a, people had automobiles, shopping centers were developing, and it was just a different way of life. And once shopping centers were built, Ellicott City no longer was needed and parking was difficult and it wasn't particularly easy to travel through there. So you saw merchants leaving and, and the customers leaving. And so there was a, a lot of economic depression probably in the 40s and 50s. With most of the world passing it by, Ellicott City became a town frozen in time. Through the 60s, restoration efforts were discussed and initiated. In 1961, Gene Hannon organized a Paint Ellicott City campaign. I, I, I hadn't read my scrapbook for some time until just the other day, and I read some of the letters that we'd gotten on it, and I thought, golly, I'd really forgotten just how how enthusiastic people were about this project and how many people uh, wrote me and said, hey, you know, it's long overdue and go ahead and, and, and do it and so on. And I think now when you go down there on a weekend, and uh, I'm not sure we haven't gone too far maybe, but, but the, uh, the crowd is like Georgetown almost and certainly the business is there and so on. And it's certainly something worth saving from a historical standpoint in Ellicott City, or in Harrod County, which I don't think I don't think it would still be there, I don't know. I think really after the floods, uh, it would have slowly been removed. The paint campaign spurred a lot of interest among the residents to clean up the rest of the city. 
The residents of the dilapidated houses on Fells Lane began efforts to clean up their own neighborhood. They wanted to do something about their conditions and how they were living. And since the county commission say, hey, you need to do something for yourself, we need to see uh, what you're going to do for yourself. So that's, I think people started taking pride in and their living conditions and started beautifying the homes in Fells Lane, and that's what started off the whole thing. Through the work of Raymond Johnson and others, the houses were bought and demolished by the county. The residents then moved into the newly built Hilltop Housing in 1970. One present-day organization dedicated to maintaining the historic district is the Ellicott City Restoration Foundation. Set up in 1980, its duty is to assist people in the private sector in maintaining an appropriate historical look to their property. They also aid in keeping Ellicott City's streets looking attractive. Right now, our major thrust is looking at things within Ellicott City that need to be upgraded in the public sector. We've been very, very successful in at least giving support to the private sector. The private sector has worked a great deal in upgrading their properties. There's been a lot of improvement in Ellicott City in the past uh, 10 years or so. And now we're looking at the things, the streetscape, street furniture, uh, utilities, the things that impact visually on uh, one's visit to Ellicott City. Today, antique and specialty shops line the streets and encourage people from all over the country to take a visit into the past. Tropical Storm Agnes hit just before the celebration of the city's bicentennial in 1972 and became a pivotal event in its restoration. The disaster seemed to bring people together rather than discourage them. With renewed energy, they were inspired to rebuild the city's structures and memories. Today, Ellicott City is Howard County's biggest tourist attraction, drawing people from all over the country who want to get a little taste of Maryland history. From early in its history, Ellicott City played a big part in area politics. In 1840, the Howard District of Anne Arundel County was formed to serve the many new residents. In 1851, the district became Howard County, and Ellicott's Mills became the county seat. In 1867, the city charter was secured and the name changed from Ellicott's Mills to Ellicott City. The structure of the county government changed several times over the years. The system in use today, with the county council as the legislative body and the county executive as the executive body, was established in 1968. Ellicott City has fought its share of disasters over time. From fires to floods, the courageous little town has stood its ground and refused to be beaten. But its setting right on the banks of the Patapsco River makes it very vulnerable to flooding. In 1972, Tropical Storm Agnes unleashed her fury on the city and caused the worst flood in its 200-year history. With rains falling for several days before the major storm hit, the ground was too saturated to soak up any more moisture. The river overflowed its banks and came rushing up Main Street, inundating the buildings in its path. Throughout the county, seven people were killed by the raging waters. Homes and businesses were severely damaged or destroyed. A number of structures that had been a part of Ellicott City for almost 200 years were lost. Although the Jonathan Ellicott House survived all of the previous storms, it finally perished in the 72 disaster, leaving only the George Ellicott House along a road that once boasted three Ellicott homes in a row. The bridge leading to the Baltimore side of the Patapsco River was washed out and another had to be rebuilt in its place. For all of the damage and destruction that was caused by Agnes, the disaster initiated some positive changes in the city. And we were coming up on our bicentennial, now that played a large part too. The, right after Agnes came the bicentennial, which had been planned for for months and months, with the pageant and all everything that goes with it, and uh, they, people sort of got their dander up and decided they were going to go ahead with that anyway, and they did. And I think that, that sparked a lot of interest in historic restoration and preservation. After Agnes hit, the National Weather Service helped the county implement a local flood warning system by installing two flash flood alarms. The county added two more, and now the system monitors four strategic locations. When the waters reach dangerous levels, an alarm sounds in central communications which puts emergency operations into action. When that goes off, the signal is sent in on a leased telephone line to central communications, which of course is manned 24 hours a day. Uh, the signal is both oral and visual, so that we can't miss it. 
And then I'm Cole. And an engineer from our Bureau of Engineering, Mrs. Elizabeth Clea. We come in, we start sending, we send people out to read the staff gauge that accompanies the flood alarm. And based on that data, rainfall data, which the fire stations give us, national weather predictions, we can almost evacuate now by house number. We've done it enough and got the system down. The system was given a rigorous test in 1975 when Hurricane Eloise hit. It gave businesses and residents advance notice of the rising waters, and they were able to get their valuables and themselves to safe ground before the waters hit. A new solar-powered flood warning system is currently being installed. The Ellicott City Volunteer Fire Department played a crucial role in the emergency operations both during and after Tropical Storm Agnes. After the water receded, we had mud on top of mud, and we pumped, I think, every basement out from the bakery to the county line and helped the people wash the streets and supplied the people with you know, water to help them any way we could to get them back in service. In operation since 1888, the department has aided the city during both natural and man-made disasters. The first firehouse was built at the corner of Church Avenue and Main Street. The department occupied one other home before finally settling into their current location in 1937. A hand-drawn ladder wagon was the first piece of equipment owned by the station. The department kept up with the modernization of fire equipment and in 1924 purchased its first motorized truck. Several fires have damaged or destroyed vital structures in Ellicott City. On the afternoon of June 7, 1914, the covered wooden bridge over the Patapsco River was burned and destroyed. The city had lost an important link to Baltimore County. Eventually, a concrete bridge was constructed to replace it. The buildings of Rock Hill College were burned to the ground in a dramatic fire in 1923. A public school was then built on the property and served the community until that school moved in 1972. In 1982, fire once again claimed the grounds. That blaze was set by an arsonist. All that remains of it today are its granite walls. Late on a November night in 1984, Main Street saw its most devastating fire to date. Seven businesses and six apartments were completely destroyed. The fire started in the back of a building occupied by Baking by Lighting and spread to adjoining buildings. Had it not been for the granite walls of the Commercial and Farmers Bank on one side and an alley on the other, the fire might well have destroyed the south side of Main Street. As it was, the buildings had to be razed for fear the facades would crumble into the streets. But Ellicott City fought its latest opponent, and by 1986, new buildings had been constructed with facades consistent with the historical flavor of the town. For Volunteer Fire Chief John Klein, who was commander of the rescue operations that November night, serving his hometown is a special duty for him. You feel like you're part of the town. I mean, I watched it. I walked Main Street for nine years going to elementary school, and I watched the buildings deteriorated. You watch them being reconstructed rejuvenated and when you've got a fire there you do your best to try to control it to get it out to not seeing what someone has worked hard in go up in ashes it's a reward that you've helped someone you've did something that's you didn't have to do Ellicott City fulfills its role of an everyday living and working town by including many of its older structures in its daily lifestyle the shops that line the downtown streets draw county residents and tourists alike to shop for everything from antiques to art, from books to baked goods. Probably the most famous structure still in use today is the B&O Railroad Terminal Building. Located at the east end of Main Street, it serves as a train museum. Visitors can view a model train garden, which is a scaled-down version of historic Ellicott's Mills. They can also learn the important role the railroad played in our country's history. The first firehouse of the Ellicott City Volunteer Fire Company was built in 1888 at the corner of Church Avenue and Main Street. For 36 years from that location, the company protected the citizens of the town against fires and other emergencies. When the company itself moved into a larger building in 1924, the firehouse continued to be used for a variety of purposes before becoming a reading room for the county library system. The building still stands today, presiding over the west end of Main Street. It was recently restored and will be used as a museum for the fire department. Churches and their congregations have played an important role in the makeup of the city's history. The Emory Methodist Church on Church Street was originally built in 1837. 
Since then, it has remained an active congregation and today looks much the same as it did when it was remodeled in 1887. Just below the courthouse on Capitol Line Hill sits the First Presbyterian Church. Built in 1894 with granite from local quarries, the church building eventually became too small for its growing congregation and had to be sold. The building was bought in 1958 and donated to the Howard County Historical Society. The church now serves as the Society's Museum, housing several exhibits each year on the history of the county. The little theater on the corner was built in 1940 as a movie house. It served several functions through the years before finally becoming the home of on-stage productions in 1982. The group offers kids from the age of 9 through 109 the ability to fulfill a dream and perform on stage. I think that, that we help the town. We bring a lot of people here. But it's also the charm of the town that attracts a lot of people to the theater and the idea of a little theater in a little town. and. It's uh, very Mickey Rooney-ish and Judy Garland-ish. The remains of some historical structures sit on the hills surrounding the city. Although they're not in use today, they overlook Main Street as if watching to make sure that today's residents are protecting and preserving the city's important past. The Patapsco Female Institute was opened in 1837 as a finishing school for young ladies from age 12 to 18. At one point, as many as 300 students were enrolled. After it closed at the turn of the century, the building had many uses, among them a hospital and a residence. Today, the structure stands in ruins on a hill overlooking the city. Archaeologists excavate on the site throughout the year and have unearthed a number of very different and interesting finds. So we've found a lot of artifacts, slate pencils, um, uh, ink wells, um, dinnerware, tableware, um, some gold jewelry things associated with the girls uh, school and um, but we've also found artifacts associated with the other occupations the uh, there was a, a hotel here in the uh, early 20th century uh, it was a hospital for World War One convalescence and um, then was a private residence and it was a dinner theater so a lot of times so the artifacts from those different periods could overlap you're not sure exactly what one is. It could be associated with the dinner theater or with the institute. So. Rock Hill College was built on the other side of town in the early 1800s. The building was operated by a number of different organizations through the years. First as a private boys school, then an institute during the Civil War, and finally after the war it was used as a college. The building eventually succumbed to fire in 1923. A public school was erected in its place in 1925 and served as the Ellicott City School, housing both elementary and high school students. In 1972, the school itself was moved to a new location, and the building stood vacant until a 1982 fire gutted the interior. Today, only the shell of the building remains. The Ellicott City Colored School served the black children of the area. Its original location was this one-room schoolhouse, now camouflaged by trees and brush at the bottom of Rogers Avenue. When the school moved to a new building in the 1950s, this was used as a church, among other things. Although it stands in a state of disrepair today, the Central Maryland chapter of the Afro-American Genealogical Society is attempting to restore the structure and use it as a black history museum for the county. We want to, what we want to do is restore the building and since Howard County black history has not really been told, and it's, and it's here, you just have to go find it in the attics and in the trunks and in the mines of the black people and in some of the obscure records of the county. We put it all together and we want to put it in here and have a Howard County Black History Center. One of the structures that still graces Main Street is the old Howard House Hotel. Although Ellicott's Mills originally existed as a milling town, in the 1800s it became known as a vacation spot for city dwellers from Baltimore. The beautiful Howard House, with its ornately railed porches, comfortable rooms, and fine restaurant, was a popular resting place for the travelers. Erected in 1850, the structure was built with local granite and still stands today. Over the years, the building has served many purposes and changed appearances a number of times. It last served as an apartment house and is now being restored. If there is any building or restoration to be done within the Ellicott City Historic District, the plans must be reviewed by the Historic District Commission. That body promotes and oversees any rehabilitation to ensure its compatibility with the historic character of the buildings in the area. 
So although the buildings around town serve a variety of different purposes, most are preserved as the houses, shops, and churches of old, looking much like they did many years ago. The stories of Ellicott City's early history can only be retrieved through second, third, or fourth hand sources. But there are people who can tell of the interesting recent history firsthand. People who lived through the city's decline and eventual restoration, watching the living historical monument of today come back to life. Charlie Clark was born on a farm outside Ellicott City, but when he was 14 years old, the family bought Mount Ida, a house just behind the courthouse. Because that house needed to be renovated, the Clarks and their 11 children had to find a temporary home. For four years, the family lived in what's the old Patapsco Female Institute. It had been used as a residence since 1890 and used as a resort and a family owned it and they had allowed my, they had moved out, the owners, and we lived up there while Mount Otto was being put in better condition, which he had bought. And so we had 90 rooms up there, I think, and even with 11, uh, that was a lot of space. And the older brothers were uh, through college by that time. Sisters were going to Goucher. And so the younger boys lived in the wing on the west side. We got tired of one room, we just moved to <laughs> Mr. Clark went to elementary and high school in Ellicott City. He was an exceptional athlete, and he was on the soccer, basketball, baseball, and track teams. After graduating in 1930, Mr. Clark went away to college and did not permanently return to Ellicott City for 54 years. The town changed drastically during that time, but his memories still exist. Well. I can walk from the top of the town to the railroad station and tell you what merchant was in every building. It was just a part of our lives. So, of course, the change to a tourist mecca is the primary change. And for that reason, the town is neater, dressed up a little better than it used to be. Doris Thompson was born right on Main Street in 1924. She was raised downtown in a close-knit neighborhood. It was just, there was just such a strong sense of community, and believe me, if you did anything wrong going your way either to or from school, your mother knew it before you got home. And they, they just seemed to watch out for everybody. And it, I, as I said, I don't think you appreciate it at the time. You sort of resent it that you have so many busybodies watching over your shoulder, but you don't have that today. Ms. Thompson's family ran the town newspaper, the Ellicott City Times, and growing up in that kind of atmosphere was very exciting. Without even realizing it then, uh, it was so interesting at night because when he came home there was always something, you know. It was always, and you, of course you were exposed to it, you were not a, a participant, but you were exposed to this. He was very involved in um, the, both the community on, and on the state level, he later was a state senator. Um, and to be on Main Street and to stop at the Times office, um, that was an interesting thing. While she was growing up, the trolley service from Ellicott City to Baltimore was a part of everyday life for Doris Thompson. Their terminus was where the uh, firehouse is now. And then they would pull in and then the conductor or the motor would go out and change the trolleys from one end to the other and move the seats, They'd face them, face them uh, east and down the street we would go again. Each winter, the steep winding roads of the city provided a wonderful track for neighborhood children to sled on. Well, Longtime resident Frank Taylor was one of those children. For example, this road out here, Church Road, uh, in the wintertime was great for sleigh riding. You could start at the top of the hill and go right down and end up in Main Street. And there were occasions when uh, we would end up in Main Street and, and why we didn't get hit by automobiles, I don't know. Uh, or hit by uh, cars coming, trying to get up this hill in the wintertime. It was always a chore. And there were occasions where a bunch of us would, you know, going sledding down the hill, and one, one would roll off and under an automobile. So there, there, and there were kind of a dangerous things we didn't take into consideration in those days. Each year, many tourists are drawn to Ellicott City by the lure of the old town, with its historic structures and streets lined with specialty shops. The Howard County Tourism Council recognizes it as the most common reason tourists come to Howard County. We call Ellicott City the jewel of Howard County. And um, because it was the first community that uh, was developed here, we really want to preserve the history. We want to promote it as our primary source of tourism, history, government, our central place in Howard County. 
The county's Economic Development Department plays a hand in the promotion of the city. They work, along with the Tourism Council, in marketing the city. That involves advertising, brochures, and mailings, just to name a few of the projects. The office also works with the Restoration Foundation, which works hard to maintain the city's streets. Primarily, Ellicott City is important for the uh, tourism attractions in the county. It's uh, really the cornerstone of, of our attractions. Uh, in Howard County, we've got Ellicott City, Savage Mill, and Columbia. And Ellicott City is um, really the area that brings in the most travelers with the uh, antique shops and the craft shops and clothing stores, restaurants, and just the special atmosphere in Ellicott City. So it's really our, it's very important for, for tourism. The Ellicott City Business Association is another organization that avidly promotes the area. Representing 60 businesses in the historic district, one of their major jobs is informing people about the opportunities in the community for both business and pleasure. They sponsor a number of annual events that draw thousands of people. Well, we promote the historic district and the surrounding business uh, community with joint advertising. We often um, sponsor advertising in written or radio media, and sometimes we've even had a video done. And this is either subsidized by the ECBA or um, sponsored within the ECBA auspices. We also do joint festivals. For example, we're with the Recreation and Parks people when we do the uh, May Arts Festival. We also are involved in the uh, Howard County Country Fair. And we also sponsor our own festivals, Millfest, a celebration of the uh, historic district and uh, everything we stand for, as well as um, Midnight Madness and Hospitality Weekend to uh, drive home the Christmas and the holiday spirit. Although Ellicott City is popular for its historic district, that portion makes up just part of the actual geographic area of the city. Well, that concludes our in-depth look into the history that makes up Ellicott City. It's been a real treat learning not only the popular history, but the personal history as well. Ellicott City has a way of taking one back in time, and I'd like to thank you for joining me on that trip.